It, I get the sense that, you know, you, you put yourselves into every show you do, every project. Hey, here he is. Michael Raymond James, everybody. <laughs> What's up, guys? I'd like to Skype from the balcony. <laughs> I thought he was still on that Southwest flight. <laughs> Mike, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. I just uh, can't see anybody. How, uh, what's going on, huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, streaming you guys from uh, some medium security uh, facility, correctional <laughs> facility that Brit's been in for the last six years. All right, well, let's start there then. Donald, Michael, like, do, do you guys ever think about sort of what has happened to these guys in the past five years, where they are now? All the time. I think Michael and I talk about it all the time. And, uh, oh. Um, you know, it, it was interesting. We uh, probably like, it, it was the only job I've ever been on where I was as, I, I can't, we can't really describe what it was like to be part of it. It was, I can't distinguish myself as being a character in this thing and as a fan of this thing and then so deeply in love with the people that were involved in this thing. And so, um, but Michael and I, uh, yeah, we, we, we talk about him getting out of jail. Where we could have, we've we've come up with all kinds of different schemes and plans and stuff, but uh, <laughs> uh, mostly it's just this. It's it's so bittersweet, you know. Even to watch it is really difficult and and uh, sometimes kind of painful. And you know, of course, my sister Karina plays Steph, you know, and she does it so brilliantly. And we've actually had a little bit of a history of mental illness in my family, and and so. It's kind of impossible to watch Terriers without going to kind of one of the heaviest places I've ever been, just just watching the show. I've never had a visceral impact like that watching television. Michael, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I miss its big brother. Yeah, no, Ma Michael, what did the show mean to you? Oh, man, uh, it's the best job I've ever had. I mean, it was, it was, so, it was such a special time uh, and a special show. Uh, uh, I mean, everybody involved with it. You know, Donald, from Donald and I living together um, in Mission Beach and, and being able to, to really um, just be in it together as brothers and, and, and you know, Curtis Weir, our DP, and... Um, uh, Ted and Sean, Marnie, every, Tim, my near, it was, it, it was such a special gig, man. I mean, it, it, it sort of felt like everything kind of came together, uh, in a beautiful way. And ever since then, I've, I've trying to chase that same feeling on, on everything, you know, and everything just sort of comes up just a little bit short, but, um, yeah, Terry's was, um, it's a pretty special gig. I'm, I'm so grateful uh, for having been able to be a part of it. Ted, where'd the idea for this come from? Uh, are, am I echoing on your computer? Okay. Uh, I had, my fir the first TV show I got, I went nuts for, I'm just gonna keep going. It's like Manny Mota. Uh, I was crazy about The Shield, and I binged that, so I called Sean up and, and uh, uh, sort of weaseled my way uh, into a season of their writer's room. And then after that was done, we had a meeting, I think Marty, Sean, and me, and, and uh, we'd talk about, was there something we could do? And uh, I had uh, no ideas except I, I sort of wanted to do something like uh, Butch and Sundance, just uh, that kind of um, uh, buddy, uh, uh, buddy story. And um, I think we just started trying to rip that off. And then uh, as it uh, evolved, it got uh, hopefully unrecognizably uh, far enough away from that. Now, my understanding is that originally uh, in conception, Hank was older than Donal and Britt was younger than Michael. Um, is, is that correct? Uh, probably uh, a bit. And um, uh, what was the other thing? Um, uh, Britt was much better looking than Michael. <laughs> Um, I mean, just the sort of like you walk into a room and you go, well, who's that guy? And then when, so when Michael walked in, it was more like, oh, all right. Um, 
Well, I mean, Sean and Marnie, talk me through a little bit about the casting process and how you wound up with these two guys being as great as they were together. It was interesting. Uh, anytime you're casting a new show, you, uh, you have to have your mind open that it could be anyone. And, and I, frankly, wasn't all that familiar with Donald's work when, when, when Donald's name got brought up. And I quickly familiarized myself with the work and was really impressed with uh, what I saw. And I remember that we, uh, we met with Donald. Um, I had an office on the Fox lot in the old Shirley Temple house, where Shirley Temple used to rehearse her dances for... Uh, <laughs> And then later, William Faulkner wrote there and got himself <laughs> drunk. And it seemed like an appropriate place to discuss terriers. Um, and so I think we, if my re recollection is correct, I think we settled on Donal first. And then we went and, and went about trying to find our Brit. And there were a few people that came in and auditioned. And I just remember something about Mikey, you know, was just so unexpected and delightful. Uh, you know, he just made me smile, uh, and um, and you were reading. Uh, I think we had a second audition where you read with him. Yeah, you read with a with you read with final contenders, or, or no? You actually came in like on a. Every person who auditioned for the show. Yeah. Is that with yeah with yeah read every that was that was the most amazing experience was. Once it was set, and then we were looking for everybody for, you know, for ultimately Kimberly and Laura and everybody. I, I read with every single person who came in to read with them, and it was so fascinating to, um, to have that experience, you know, that you could really get the rhythms of all the actors. And when Rockman came in, it was interesting because it's, for some people, it's clear. They kind of take it within, yeah. they take it, they own it within a few seconds. And... You know, I remember Michael, I do remember John Landgraf saying, because it was conceptually different for Michael, he said, let it be said that I did not choose the best actor for the part. Because it was, he wasn't exactly what had oh, been right, pitched right, right, right. or something like that. And Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We took him to a makeup trailer on the lot. We just hijacked one and got you a haircut. Because so, Michael came in with like a headband and his hair was kind of long. And he just looked. <laughs> Get a haircut! Yeah. Well, Hippie. Michael, you, you knew Donal already a little bit before this, so what do you remember about coming in and reading with him that time? Is that to me? Yeah, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, Donal and I met on an episode of Life where we just sort of, he, he was carrying around a copy of Kerouac's Big Sur, and, uh, uh, you know, Jack Kerouac is... Somebody who like moved the furniture around in my brain when I was uh, 18 years old, and and uh, that's one of my favorite books. And, we, and so we just started talking, riffing on Kerouac, and and immediately felt this vibe of like, God, I love this dude. Um, and uh, and so when I came in to read for uh, for Terriers. And I saw him, I, I passed him in the, I think I passed him in the hall. Did I pass you on the stairs, Donald? Uh, I'll tell you what um, it was. There was, a, there was a bunch of other guys, and we all kind of know each other. There were guys in the waiting room waiting to go in and read. Right, and right. Michael came up the stairs, and I was waiting in this little um, kind of waiting area in front of the audition room. And I was like, what's up? <laughs> we, gave, we gave each other a massive bro hug, and you can tell. And it's not necessarily cool, but the deflation of the other two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. These fucking guys know each other. Like, best fucking friends. Uh, I was so genuinely excited to see you. you know? Yeah, I was stoked, man. It was, uh, it was, it was awesome. It was awesome. And the, uh, the other thing about Cassie I remember is, you know, was he'd written this character, Gustafson, that was always going to be the Swede in the show. And then we decided that, you know, maybe we wanted some diversity. We, we should read some black actors. And, and then we never changed the name, you know. <laughs> we, so we cast Rockman, and he was always just Gustafson. But I can't remember if we refer to him ever as the Swede. Like, what's the Swede going to do, even though he's obviously not Swedish? Uh, I, I, we, we I think I kept pressing to, to call him the Swede once, but okay. I don't know if we ever did. Now, Tim, you'd had some experience on a very different kind of private eye show in, in Angel, and sort of... in, in 
in, in telling these stories, how, how did you guys decide like how good Hank and Britt were at this, sort of what sort of cases they would take, how successful they could be, whether in this larger Linda story or just the, the episodic stuff they went through? Uh, well, I'll just say that, uh, um, that I've been involved with a lot of failures. And of all the failures, um, this is my favorite. <laughs> um, and, as to your question, Ted was, Ted was very specific about what the show was, and it was almost like when we were working on stories or talking about cases, he would reference a lot of, of his favorite movies, but also it was, it was almost like a jazz band. We'd be riffing in the room. In fact, we broke an entire story um, as Sondheim songs. <laughs> the, enti the entire writer's staff, it was, I mean, it was pretty gay, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> the entire writer's staff was very familiar with Sondheim, and so we would riff and pitch and break stories by singing out uh, in the form of a Sondheim song. Uh, I remember that, uh, but uh, no, it, it was really Ted's uh, sensibility and uh, he always could feel if things were going in the wrong direction, and even if he didn't have a specific way to quantify something, he, we, we just went off his instinct, really. You make me sound like I was throwing shit against the wall. <laughs> a little like, bit. Or, like poop. Like, I don't like that. Uh, <laughs> it was a little bit like I, that. Okay. Uh, and I think, that, I think that actually comes across, I mean, look, I've worked on, in a lot of rooms where things are put together sort of nuts and bolts, mm -hmm. but with you in the room, it was different, and it was a little bit more like throwing stuff up against the wall. It was really, we were really feeling our way through it, and I think that that is reflected in the way that the show feels completely realized, like you're in, you're in the water and the air of this world from the moment you come in, and that's actually quite rare, that it's that, it's that fully realized at the beginning. And I, I watch Terriers, and I feel like that, that's a world that I want to be in, and it's a world that extends beyond the frame. <clears throat> yeah. I've never been in, you know, Tim would come down, Sean would come down, Ted came down with his brother, and and it was such, we were all so excited every day of shooting. Um, and I remember we shot that one scene of sma like smashing, going back and taking the sledgehammer to the house or something. And then Tim would come in excitedly and say, oh, when you were doing that, you were remembering, remembering. Or, you know, we would, there, there was something so special that there was, there was no, there, there are times sometimes where from my perspective, you feel like you're putting yourself out there and you're doing something and you're going for it and you do it and then you can kind of see someone sitting behind a monitor off to your left and they're like, another, go, no, you know, and it was like, and you feel disconnected from, from the two camps. And then in this one, it felt like we were just a family making this thing together and getting excited together about the possibilities. and. Um, it was unique. It was very unique and special in that way. And it was all from the writers. You know, everything, everything starts with this empty page that they gave us. And I know for Michael, I can speak as well. It was like, no, there was no greater gift I can think of being given as an actor than the, than the parts of Hank and Britt, you know, so. Yeah. One of the things I hear all the time, people ask me, well, th this is a show that was canceled, you know, sh should I watch it? And I tell them, no, it tells a complete story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it wraps up really satisfyingly. How much of the larger case with Lindis and Zeitlin and Cutshaw and everything did you know from the beginning, Ted, and how much did you guys sort of feel your way through over the course of that year? Uh, I remember at the, when the writers were first gathered, we started playing uh, in another total waste of time, uh, or it seemed at the time, uh, we would play a soundtrack challenge where we would, somebody would bring in uh, the soundtrack from a movie and we'd try to guess what it was. But at some point we just like, started listening to a lot of All the President's Men in Chinatown, and it just sort of put us in that sort of grand conspiracy mode. So I think we decided early on that, uh, that the Lindis thing would end up I can't remember when the airport, uh, by the way, spoiler alert, but uh, uh, that, that, it would, uh, that that would be sort of the reveal. But a lot of it was uh, making it up as we go along. And my favorite thing about this, watching this episode was that uh, Hank takes possession of Mickey Gosney's stuff 
just the and, and it's just a scene about how sad his life was that his life is become just things that can be put in a box. And then six episodes later, it turns out that the thing that's gonna get him out of this hot water is actually Mickey Gosney has in that box. But when we wrote this scene, we had no idea that we were gonna uh, do that. Um, which is the great thing about television of like, oh, we, we had a box five episodes ago, let's make something out of that. Um, which I think is, I learned from uh, when on The Shield, when you guys saw that Forrest Whitaker had a wedding ring on one scene and you thought, Oh, let's give him a wife later on. Which, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> this is about Terry's now the shield. But yeah, that was the last thing I learned when Forrest Whitaker accidentally wore his real life wedding ring in an episode of The Shield for a character that we had said on screen was divorced. And and I came back and said, well, why would a divorced guy wear his wedding ring still? And it led to an episode that turned out to be one of our best ones of, of that season. And so you're always looking back and remembering what you did, and trying to make it all seem as if you intended it along the way. So, um, Michael and Donald, you did not only live together, but my understanding is you lived together in a one-bedroom house down there. It was, it was fancy. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a one-bedroom house. We fa it was a very strange house, right, Michael? Because the, yeah, we, started, we rented yeah. this house through normal channels, and then we got there, and someone was living there, and the guy was bummed. He had to move out. And, the guy was kind of a cokehead who owned it and was like, no, no, man, he's a buddy of mine. He's just, he'll get his shit out of here. It's okay. <laughs> and it was this really modern glass house that looked over Mission Beach and it had the third, it was such a weird bachelor pad, remember, Mike? It was like, it had like a shower for 14 on the top floor and then it like, <laughs> they had a Murphy bed on the second floor where Michael was living and then, um, and then you know, but it was, uh, I don't know. When we was, first said we were going to live obvious. together, everybody I mean, the, was The square freaking. footage of the first floor was probably 10 by 10. And yeah, then, it was like, you know, and then, then it just kind of expanded upwards. In a, it was like a very Dr. Seuss looking sort of house. But, you know, I have to say when we did Terriers, it was so all consuming that we were just running lines around the clock. And, uh, <clears throat> It yeah, we were always prepared, man. You it know, wasn't we, a very we were... casual environment, like I would have to say that. And I would yeah. even say for, for some people who would show up, who were kind of used to coming in and out of shows and absolutely doing fine jobs and stuff, we had this kind of angry, slightly angry pit bull energy of like, don't just show up half-assed and kind of yeah. do a decent job. We're doing something different here. And everybody, yeah. all the other actors got on board with it. Would you say that, Michael? Like, you know, yeah. we just, people need to be prepared. They need to show up and have, you know, they don't need to have sides in their hands trying to figure out the scene before we're about to shoot it. That's right. I, I'm sorry if it makes for a, a boring panel when uh, everyone says how much they uh, loved doing it and loved each other, but, uh, because it would be much more fun to talk about how uh, Donald and I fought constantly. Um, totally. But we didn't. <laughs> Uh, it was a, it was a love fest, and uh, uh, and one thing I, I want to say is is because we were riding up in uh, Los Angeles, and uh, Donald and Mikey were sort of the mayors of the set. Uh, they set a great example, and and were uh, nobody worked harder than them. And because they were pretty much in every scene and every scene together, they never really got uh, a time out. Uh, so uh, uh, that's what kind of made the train run on time down south in um, San Diego. Um, well, we would get the we would get the call sheet for tomorrow, and and you know, I remember sort of a, a vibe coming from FX initially when we were talking about living together, Donald. Where they're like, "Fuck, please don't live together. The <laughs> actors are fucking insane, and and you guys are gonna be working together so much, it's gonna be you, you're gonna hate each other." And we were like, "Dude, fuck, we I, I've known this guy for ages. He's my brother. It's fine." And then when we did it, I think it really did pay dividends in the way Ted's talking about what you touched on, Donald. You know, we would get the call sheet for tomorrow and we'd go back to Mission Beach and we would run lines. And, you know, sometimes you would you would read Laura's part for a scene with me and her. And, and I would, you know, uh, uh, I would, you know, we'd, 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 it didn't matter if it was just Hank and Britt. We would trade. We, I'd, I'd play Rockman for you. Um, and I think that paid enormous dividends in, in terms of just being able to be immersed in it 100% of the time, showing up to set and ready to jam. It was no, there was no fucking around. There was no, 
what's this scene about? Should we call Ted or Sean? And I, I'm confused. Yeah. We we all we already done our homework, and we're ready to jam. And it it, it was such a, uh, you know, I don't know. It was um, it was a beautiful thing. It was a it was, it was beautiful. a beautiful beautiful it must, time. It must be hard too for. I mean, I always have respect for directors that come in on shows, and it's really, it's that weird thing where like they come in and then someone immediately just starts dragging their heels like i don't know if i want to do it this way or it's like we don't have time for that shit. you know we just need to jump in and do our job and and get going and i think that we all had that kind of you know that ethic and i think sean and ted and tim respected that in us that we didn't you know their jobs are so friggin' hard they're trying to put together these you know when I looked at this episode and I remember the wind patterns or whatever, I remember shooting it not having an idea. I don't know what those wind patterns are. I just trust that you guys have put these bricks in place further down the road that we're going to discover. <coughs> so we can't sit there and fight the writers with, um, you know, we were so lucky to have, the, to have the writing staff that, and the writing staff that we had was so deep. You know, Leslie and all these different people who they came up and had, they've had amazing careers because they got, you know, these guys gave them a chance and it's, um, it was a really, you know, one thing is the fruits of the tree of terriers has, you know, the tree of terriers has borne a lot of fruits in other worlds since terriers went down. In fact, Ryan Johnson got Star Wars purely on his episode of Terriers. <laughs> I, just, I just want to go publicly on that. Ryan Johnson was great. Lucasfilm called me up and said, do you want to do the next Star Wars? I said, you know what? Ryan should. <laughs> give, it, give it to Ryan. It's really more his thing. And um, have I been invited to set? No. Okay, I, I just want to say, because I, mean, I flew out to Austin to say a couple things. One is, Ted and Sean are two of the guys that I've loved working with the most, and I requested to be on the show, and I want to thank Ted for hiring me when you didn't really know me. You just went off Sean's recommendation. And Donald and Michael are the two best actors I have ever worked with, and I've worked with some great actors. It's, it's really true, and I, I will say, I remember being down in San Diego, and we were shooting uh, an episode that I, I wrote specifically so we could shoot it in six days, because we were over budget. Yeah. We shot it in six days. It was a flashback episode. And there was a scene that I didn't write that well, or at least a speech. And I said to, to Donal, can you, he, here's the intention of the scene, and I'm not sure how to, how to rewrite the speech. And he's, he says, uh, don't worry, I, I've got it. He didn't change a word of it, but his acting made it clear. So that was brilliant. Um, and then finally, I was watching the last scene that we were shooting for the episode and realized that there was a scene missing which was the last flashback of the episode. I ran back to the hotel, I wrote the scene, I came back, I handed it to the actors. They did not complain, they loved it, we shot it, and we still didn't go over uh, that day. So anyway, I, I wanna thank everybody who's here because this was a great experience for me and I'm really proud of it. How much, uh, how much do you guys hear about this little show that at the time nobody watched but sort of lived, lives on and has filled this theater today? Like, is, is it something that comes up often in your, your lives? Yeah, I hear it about a lot. And then, you, you know, I mean, like two, two and a half years ago, there was this random article I was reading where Reed Hastings, you know, head of Netflix, was talking about what shows and just randomly mentioned how well Terriers did on Netflix. And I, I, I thought... My God, because nobody ever watched that show. <laughs> and, uh, and listen, you know, a little self-servingly, I like to think we were just a couple years ahead of our time and that, and that the fate of the show would have been different. And, and I'm very appreciative that, that people have, you know, through time and through streaming, um, have been able to discover it uh, and embrace it. And I can't tell you how many times... You know, I get the, you know, did they turn left or did they <laughs> go straight? Uh, you know, which, which way did they go and what happened? And, you know, and, uh, you know I said, well, you, you'd have to ask Ted. Um, you know, what was great for me on the show was after, you know, having loads of responsibility um, you know, on previous shows, it was great to kind of... Um, D defer 
um, to somebody else's vision. Um, it's hard to be the creative kind of head of a show and be responsible for everything. And it's, it was so lovely just to sort of say, what do you want to do, Ted? You know, and have and have Ted really drive, um, you know, the creative vision of the show, and then to have somebody like Tim, who, you know, for reasons I won't even get into, was hugely instrumental in my career, going back into the '90s. Um, to have these guys be able to just say, "Let's do this," and then and then I would chime in occasionally on some things, and I think I was useful in the editing room, you know. But really, this was Ted's vision. And to be part of something that I could have never come up with on my own, and and the way these guys banter, and the way these guys deal, and 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 to work was was um, was really a pleasure. Now you know Netflix does have this reputation for occasionally taking shows in their library and reviving them to add to the catalog. Is that when you read that article about Reed Hastings, did you have any inkling of maybe making a call? I think we may have. Uh, investigated it but I guess what I would like to say right now is if everyone who's in this audience would put would contribute a hundred thousand dollars a person <laughs> usually people sort of do this online and crowdsource but I just want to go every one of you a hundred thousand um, dollars I think uh, which is to say I think we would like to make a uh, movie and I think we have sort of the idea of what to do for uh, and now we just have to Clear it with Fox. Your checks just need to clear, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and find some. Yeah, there's there's political things we'd have to figure out. Fox, uh, you know, Fox has the rights, and 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 I think that people there, when they saw the initial ratings, I think wrote the show off in many ways. You know, the show's never been released on DVD, which is of endless frustration to me. Um, but you know, this is the kind of show where I feel like if Donald and Mikey were up to it and, and Ted had the story he wanted to tell, this is the world that I definitely would revisit given the opportunity. I think I have a title fix. Oh, well, oh yeah. yeah? It's uh, Beach Cop Detectives. <laughs> Beach Cop Detectives. <laughs> Alright, so let's, let's, talk, let's talk about the, the dog in the room, the elephant in the room. Where did the title come from? What sort of other things were you thinking about at the time before you landed on Terriers? I had been listening to the Beatles song, Hey Bulldog, which I think is a great opening credit song, uh, which nobody could ever afford uh, for a show. And so the title, Hey Bulldog, came into my mind. And then in the middle of the meeting, I said, well, let's just call it Terriers for now. And everyone was fine. OK, yeah, for right now. And then we had a contest of, like, what's the better title? and. Uh, uh, I think there were some almost, um, there's still no, like six years later, no one title that uh, everyone has said, well, that should have been it. Um, except for um, Ted Griffin's Terriers, I think, probably. <laughs> I, like, I like that one maybe more than other people. Do you, remember, do you remember having a better title? I wanted to call it Small Time Dicks. <laughs> uh, and the porn version of, it, of Terriers is called that. Um, also starring Michael Raymond James. Yep. Um, it's short, but at least it's skinny. <laughs> <laughs> That's on the poster. They're short, but at least they're skinny. Uh, oh, uh, uh, I just want to say this. And uh, uh, one thing I really enjoy about television as, uh, is that the auteur theory has not invaded it. Um, the true theory in movies is sort of like the idea that this a, a director has a vision and that it's, uh, movies come from one person is 99% of the time horseshit. And the thing I really love about television is that uh, this show would uh, not have been the show it was uh, without all the people on the stage and probably another five or six who aren't here and probably more than that. And um, uh, it is really the accumulation of uh, all of our personalities. and. Um, uh, and that's why it's sort of dissecting of like this, uh, this happened because of that. It doesn't matter. It's just sort of like it is a, a truly a group effort. And so uh, I love all of you people and, um, and the people who are not here, I sort of like. 
So, but going back to the, the title for a second, you know, there were some people who were convinced, oh, the title killed the show, or that poster of the snarling dog, you know, kept people from watching. They thought it was about dog fighting. Like, this was a great show that, again, not a lot of people watch. What do you think it was, the, you know, this was five years ago, before there were eight million scripted shows on TV. What was the barrier to entry that prevented this from becoming the big hit it should have been? Well, there's a lot. First of all, the only person I ever heard who loved the title of the show was my mother, who, who raised show dogs and raised wire fox terriers. <laughs> and she was like, oh, I love terriers as a title. Because I confided in her that I was sort of worried that the title was confusing. And she was like, no, it's great. Um, the, the title was a barrier. Uh, I think for, what I, listen, FX is justifiably proud of so many of their ad campaigns. Um, for their shows, and I know if you talk uh, to John Landgraf, he'll, you know, he'll defend their their ad campaign on this show. Um, I think it started a little bit late. I I don't think we ever sort of nailed how to tell an audience what to expect in this show. Um, you know, unfortunately, great reviews don't always convince people to to watch something, uh, and I've kind of come to terms over the years with the idea that that what makes this show great also just made it incredibly difficult to sell. And that if you changed it to something that would be easier to sell, I think it wouldn't have been as great as it was. And, and the only difference is now, if we made it now, we could call it a 10 episode miniseries and declare success. <laughs> I, I do think though, from my perspective, and this is just absolutely just my, this is a suspicion I had. When the show started, and what I love so much about Terriers, from the from like Gomez and Brothers, to, you know, mm -hmm. that it does this kind of wide looping circle from the pilot on, where it is kind of funny and it is exactly. kind of goofy, <laughs> and and that you don't know exactly. Maybe they are small, maybe they are big time or whatever. But what happened with this episode of Foster Club was that all of a sudden. These, all these points got locked into a vortex. And both Michael and myself, this was something that was also happened that these guys helped me out with and were aware of. I broke my shoulder on this episode. Ooh. And so I did the rest of the series with a broken shoulder, which was pretty interesting. And within, within this whole thing, Michael and I, everything got really intense. Karina was intense, Rockman was on board. And I have a feeling because Stephanie and those people at FX Marketing who are geniuses, no doubt, they were, they were still back in the circling, swirling world. They were busy trying to launch other stuff. They were working on other shows. And so by the time that they showed up to, to, to film, we were involved in the heaviest drama I've ever, I was on Sons of Anarchy, I was on Vikings and stuff, but I've never been in a vortex like Terriers when it was in that vortex. And that's when we were, we were arguing, we were like doing these promos where we're fighting over big gold sunglasses. And I was like, have you guys seen the last few episodes? Would you like to see them? Because I think the show is heavier than I think people think it is, even from the inside. And I think it was just a, it, I honestly think that that was the case, that it started that way, it was pitched a little bit lighter, but somehow in the middle of making it, we made, went down this kind of rabbit hole that they, that some people weren't aware of. Or does that make, does that yeah. make any sense? Cool. I, I think, think we have time for a couple of audience questions, so if anyone wants, all right. Any, anyone, anyone? <laughs> all right, good night. Um, well, no, I have to just say first of all, I'm with Kathy, I'm always with you forever and ever. ever. <laughs> and when I, when I told my mother and all my friends that I was flying here from Florida to do this, and you were the main reason, you. they're like, who? <laughs> And I said, you know, you're like that actor who everyone knows who you are, but not necessarily by name. Have you found that a lot in your career? Can you pop up everywhere? Sons of Anarchy, like you mentioned, Viking, Blown Over, SVU, Gotham. I mean, you're like everywhere, and you're awesome. And yet, when I say your name to people, they have to be reminded of who you are by me naming your resume. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe that's like the ultimate compliment in a way, you know? Like, uh, I do have a friend who I love dearly, but he. And it's not Michael Raymond James. Michael's so on board with me with this thing. But <laughs> I have a friend who digs being a celebrity. <laughs> and then there are people who hate being celebrity. Like, you know, you kind of got into this thing because 
you could express yourself in a really interesting way, but um, that other side of it is kind of weird and funky, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I've just been a, I've been so fortunate. But you know, Terriers was absolutely the apex. Uh, I, I've been trying to write now and do different things and writing the novel, and I don't know, acting gets to be a beat down a little bit, and. Um, and I, I would say if someone was like, well, what have you done as an actor? What would you do? It's just like, watch these 13 episodes of Terriers. Wow. And that's that's what I've done in that wow. world as, as an actor. It has to be so hard for you guys when there's such shit on TV, like Honey Boo Boo and Bachelor and all the other It's all good, though. And they get rid of you guys. And they're like, brilliant writing and acting. But and you know, everything is weirdly people. kind of fair. The fact that Terriers went down the way it went down, it ends on such a beautiful existential yeah. note. That it, it's, and the fact that there's Netflix. I saw something the other day where Terriers is still the most downloaded show in Maine and Washington. Washington. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's including Honey Boo Boo or that's including that and Game of Thrones, whatever. Like, how many states is it top five? And we made a show no one watched, and yet all these years later, people are watching it every day still. Yeah. And it makes me proud of it. It makes me like feel like we did something like Bloodline or, or Broad Church or Happy Valley or something. Yeah. That I, the kind of shows I love. This exactly. isn't a Sondheim quote, but it is a Broadway musical quote. I'd rather be nine people's favorite thing than a hundred people's ninth favorite thing. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, you can download uh, what's the name of that show? Title <laughs> show. There. Which one? Never mind. <laughs> Do we have time? Any more audience questions out there? Thank you for the light. Oh, very yeah. bright. Yeah. Would you ever consider a crossover with The Shield in, in the world where you get to make all the sequels you want to make? <laughs> well, boy, now, now, now you're talking about a lot of uh, contractual uh, things that would have to be figured out. In a hypothetical world, um, I think it would be very interesting to see uh, Vic Mackey run into Hank and Britt. And see, see who can... My, my guess is that like Vic would... Uh, you know, maybe give Hank a little bit of a beat down that, that Hank would secretly feel he deserved and Britt would and Britt would sneak out the back door and escape it and then check in later and say, Hey, how'd it go, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've told we got we have time for one more if someone has a quick one uh, right down there. Um, just being selfishly my hometown San Diego, what was the choice and why? I think it was originally because I was familiar with uh, Carpinteria up by Santa Barbara as sort of a, uh, a working class beach town. And then uh, Craig Brewer, who directed the pilot, um, we found out that there was a uh, tax rebate in San Diego and he went down and he found uh, uh, OB. And so uh, credit Craig Brewer for uh, for finding that. And then once we went down there, I said, oh, this is uh, much more colorful. Um, but I, I would say the inspiration for it was, if you've ever seen a movie called Cutter's Way, sort of the depiction of Santa Barbara up there, uh, uh, sort of influenced uh, what we were going for. Um, but San Diego was a fabulous place to, to live and work for. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm from El Centro, so. Uh. We worked El Centro into it so many times. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Michael. Well, the cast and creative team of Terriers, thank you all for coming.